Well, maybe, maybe, maybe you're in the wilderness. We don't know. We'll never know. It's like how many licks does it take to get to the center of a Tootsie Pop? The, the world may never know. Yeah, but I don't have a beak. I don't have the beak of an owl. So, I mean, there's that. Um, but tonight, I just, I figured since we've been doing this for about a year now, and we've covered a wide variety of subjects, like all over the grid, where some of you guys have been here for a good portion of them, uh, and endured with me since the very beginning of time, um, or some of you came when we first got into this building and some just joined and some are in between. And so figured since we've been doing this a while, why not do some, I mean, I know we've done Q and A before. Don't smirk at me like that, William. I feel like there's going to be all these like, you know, algebra equations, but, uh, so I figured let's do a little Q and A and, but it doesn't have to necessarily pertain to the subject matter that we've covered. Maybe it's something we haven't. And so, but I think, I think something I would start out with is I think sometimes we, we confuse with what we're going through or what we're experiencing at the time and feel like it's a, nationwide thing you know we just because we're having a bad day so there's troubles in the body of christ that are happening and we're all in a troubling season and it's i was once told a story about a young man who wasn't having struggles with certain things in life and an older much wiser I would use all that in air quotes. Uh, individual said, I discern that you're dealing with this in your life. Well, the interesting fact is, is that young man wasn't dealing with it at all. He was projecting. And the, the interesting part, the downfall of said young man was the thing that ended up getting prophesied over him. Our words have power, life and death. And I think sometimes we forget about that, that just because we are experiencing something, maybe it's not going as fun as we'd like it to, does not necessarily mean that everyone's going through that. Just because we deal or struggle with something doesn't mean someone else is. But oftentimes when we're struggling with something, we will recognize it in somebody. We'll go, oh, like let's say hypothetically, so someone we know can't handle spicy, we can't handle spicy food. Salt is spicy to us. Ketchup has too much flavor. And so we see someone else that we notice that they too don't put salt or ketchup on anything. And so we go, I see that you're like me and things are too spicy for you. And we start saying all these things and projecting all these ideals on them in all actuality. They just don't like sodium. They're a hippie or whatever. But now all of a sudden they form a, a strong sensitivity to everything spicy. They used to enjoy the flavor of mustard, and now it's too spicy for them. We've projected and created something that wasn't there. And, we, and so realizing that life and death are inside of the tongue, we can create or we can destroy. It really is up to us. You know, one, I remember we were doing the School of Life, in 2020, if I remember correctly, February of 2020, because when we had the big snowstorm. 
and we and a question was proposed what about this um, and it was a hot button item and many people there's really two there's two sides of the coin and it's well if these absolutely do exist and then on the other side of the coin these don't exist and it was like well which one is it and it was presented back which do you believe your faith at what's your faith in and so there are times when we are speaking things over people and individuals that are not necessarily them it's us and we're on the struggle bus they are not and so it's important that we are able to identify that there is power there's life there is death inside the words that we speak inside the words that we use and we will either create or destroy So that's that's my opening statement to that. So any questions? Anything at all? Well, this will be the shortest Q and A's we've ever had no questions at all I'll just I can go home <laughs> no No, everybody knows everything. We're good to go. Let's go home. I love the animal question. Not <laughs> keep them away from fires and small and small feet. Can Christians be okay? We have a question from online, an online viewer. Can Christians be demonized? Demonized. Doesn't say necessarily possessed. I would say, have you ever been tormented? Then yes. You will often see where people are being demonized. Where a tormenting spirit or something of that nature, you find yourself at sleep in the middle of the night, sleep paralysis. That's often fairly popular where you feel like you can't move, you can't anything that is something that is not of God and it has you stuck in a place it has you stuck in a position and maybe you even find yourself short of breath and in that that in that moment is not the spirit of the Lord that is not God that is something demonic thus being you're now being demonized now is there have I seen people get delivered of stuff Yes. Have I seen a... The odd part about when watching people go through deliverance is there's a lot of flesh still involved in the deliverance process. And where it's like, you know, they're going through the motions, they're going through the actions or whatever it might be, and they're, they're manifesting something. But then they're sitting there like for 38 minutes, just, ah, you know, whatever's going on. And the question is, is you know, where did said not so God thing ha end, and where's the human beginning? Because we often it, it kind of gets a little bit of mixed in, a little bit of mixture, and so sometimes what they're fighting is just them. We're often trying to get people. To, people often want to be delivered from their flesh. That ain't going anywhere. I mean, I'm just gonna walk around as a skeleton. That's, well, that'd be weird. 
And we have to, your new nickname would be Bones. But, so, thank you for that question. Uh, hopefully that answers it to some degree. But, you know, we're in the... We're in this place where if we're listening, God is definitely speaking more and more. And, you know, we, uh, we're try I think we're always in a place trying to figure that out. Is that the Lord? Is that not the Lord? And how do, how do we discern that? How do we discern what is the voice of God? What if God's talking to you about a cell phone? <laughs> well, my, my point being is if, because that, no, that is a very popular answer. How do I, how do I identify that God is speaking to me? Does it line up with his word? What if he's, all right, Tw end of 2019, around 2020, the Lord starts talking to me about internet and, the th and changes that were coming in the internet and how we were going to see changes in internet speeds and how it was going to revolutionize the way that he was able to touch and reach people. Show me one scripture about the internet. Unless you could find a verse, unless you could find the fifth chapter part G of it or something, we're not going to find anything about internet in the Bible. Dear Lord. <laughs> you still believe in that? Love you. I, thought you, I thought you had delivered of that. Speaking of being demonized. <laughs> Can someone have the head knowledge of Jesus' salvation but no heart revelation? That's a question from online. Can someone have the head knowledge? Well, the head knowledge, the intellectual knowledge of salvation would be somebody who's aware of what scriptures say, but however, are not allowing the Lord to reign inside their heart. The right. That's, well, that's a lack of intimacy and a lack of submission. You know. Right. And so, yeah, somebody can have the head knowledge, the intellectual knowledge of salvation. You can get into the Greek and the sozo and break it down. It means healed, saved, delivered, all that sort of stuff. But the heart, why? I, I would even adventure out to say that many people still don't have the heart revelation of salvation. You talk about as if they're not changed. Well, what about the person who's beating themselves up in condemnation? Because they're lacking it too. They've changed, but all they do is beat themselves up because of how they once were. That's not salvation. That sounds worse. You were better off not knowing in that case. And so there's a, there's a heart revelation that's always going to take place. All I can think of is like Shrek, and, and he's like, ogres are like onions. It's like onions to a degree because you don't necessarily, it, there's different layers. Or it's like a parfait. Ever met anybody that didn't like a parfait? They're like, I don't like no parfait. Um, but it's, it's all these, it's layers of it. I can teach a five-year-old the principles of algebra, but they're only going to understand it to the, concept, to the ability in which they understand numbers. But in a few years, I can teach them a little bit more. And then in a few years, I can teach them a little bit more. I was actually listening to this. Uh, I was listening to this teaching from a uh, Catholic priest in Canada. And he was talking about how sometimes people think that God changed from the Old Testament to the New Testament. 
And, and he goes, well, what if it was God was introducing himself in portions over time? Yes, I'm a God of justice. I'm a God of righteousness. I'm a God of, of, of holiness. I'm a God of this. But then when Jesus comes and we get introduced into the New Testament, well, it's great that you want justice, but you know what's even better? Mercy. Forgiveness. Compassion. And so it introduces a whole new concept of walking with the Lord. You know, we, we hear how people are like, well, I want, I want to see justice. I want to see the, you know, and oftentimes it's more, it sounds more like revenge than it does justice because it's just in what you see, not necessarily what the, the Lord sees as justice because the Lord sees justice as both sides winning. But in Second, First Timothy chapter 2, 3, or later, or maybe chapter 3, but he says, I desire that all men would be saved. All, you know, in the old, you know, youth group way of teaching. You know what the Greek word for all is? It's all. And so he's wanting all people to be saved and wanting to come into the knowledge of who, his, who Jesus is and the salvation that's offered to them. But all of the salvation. Many ways, I mean, if we as Christians are no different than the Israelites coming out of Egypt. We create our own prison right after getting delivered from, from the torment of the enemy of our lives. We just call it different things. So here you have the Israelites. They've wandered about in the wilderness. They, they ne Their shoes didn't break over 40 years. I can't get shoes to last four months sometimes. No, not 40 years. Anyways, um, I was ruining my own head in that moment. They didn't, none of them fell sick. The pillar by night, pillar of fire by day, cloud by night, or cloud by day, fire by night. I swear I'd, I've read these things. But they're, they're like all this supernatural stuff's happening. And they finally get out of there. They finally get out of the wilderness. And what do they find themselves in? They're re-enslaving themselves. But now they're doing it to each other. God says, I want to be your God and you could be my people. And they said, we'd like a king. You know what that is? That's going grocery shopping and hitting the drive through at the same time. It's going grocery shopping and ordering a pizza on your phone so it's delivered by the time you get there. We're just re-imprisoning ourselves the entire time. And so what happens is, is we start getting familiar and comfortable with church. We start get, finding ourselves building these types of systems and these different things that in order, you know, if we have these formulas, we can obtain these certain goals that we're trying to reach. But now we've re-oppressed ourselves. We've put ourselves back into a form of prison. We found a form of godliness that has no power at all whatsoever. And we live from that, that, that state of being. And there's no freedom in that. Asked, can a lost Christian be saved from their ways? I sure hope so, <laughs> because there's a, there's a lot of lost Christians <laughs> that are looking, that are, I mean, I was a wandering Christian for a bit. I got worn out. I was exhausted. I was tired of the, the politics of uh, ministry and, you know, the who's who of the charismatic zoo, and, like, it was kind of like... It was more like, you know, being a part of like Santa's, you know, magical reindeer. And, you know, you get marred off like you're Rudolph because you have a bright and shining nose and no one invites you to play any reindeer games. And so I just got tired of it all. 
And I found myself in a place where I was like, wow, I love God, but I'm not so sure about the church. I'm not so sure about the people. They're a little cuckoo. But then I, I found myself in this position where I was speaking for uh, inspirational messages and people would come up to me and they're like, there's something about you that reminds me of a pastor from a church. You sound like a minister. Why is it that, why is it that you have like a 100% closure rate when you do sales seminars? I'm like, have you ever given an altar call? <laughs> but I was still there. So the answer, yes, a lost Christian can be resaved, refound. Many of us probably are lost Christians. <laughs> Looking, I mean, salvation isn't a once thing; it's like an everyday thing. You know, Matthew nine, Jesus is eating and drinking and with the sinners and tax collectors. And this is like one of my favorite passages. So Jesus is eating and drinking with these guys, and like the Pharisees don't like it. They, you know, what about your witness? I'm sure we've all heard that before. If you're with these people, it's going to ruin your witness. Like, no, those are the people that probably need to be witnessed too, but that's cool. Um, and so Jesus is like, well, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Like, you live from this place of boasting in what you give to God, but you don't have any mercy towards people. You actually make the road to God more difficult. You kind of complicate it a little bit. You add rules that aren't even there. Instead of, instead of putting a, like, you know, a four-way stop sign, you just close down the road. What he told him exactly was that you've washed the outside of your cup, but the inside's still dirty. Have you guys ever seen what the inside of a coffee cup looks like after years of not being washed? Yeah. Pardon? Not years. Oh, I've seen years. You can't even wash that coffee off. You have to sandblast it. Or throw it away. Off of maybe the fifth floor of a building. But, uh... But he says, you've washed the outside of this cup, but the inside's still dirty. So in other words, you make yourself look like you're holy. You make yourself look like you're clean and pure and that you can be presented before God. But in all actuality, you're wicked and vile on the inside. But he says, I came for those who knew, who know they need a Savior. Not for those who think they're well. Because he gets referred back to as like being a uh, as a physician. And he's like, I came for those who know they are sick, not those who think they are well. And I think it's interesting that he gets presented as people who perceive their wellness, people who perceive their spirituality of being in a good state. When many times when most people living from a place of concern in the sen in a sense not second guessing and living in doubt and fear but the people go man I'm I'm just I'm I'm in shambles I need a I need a Jesus in my life those people are better off than the people walking around with their head he held up in kind of this false sense of confidence because the outside looks dirty but internally they're full of judgment and criticism that's why Jesus brought it to another level. If you've actually, if you look upon someone with hate, you've murdered them. If you've looked upon someone with lust, then you have committed adultery. He brought it back to matters of the heart, not necessarily matters of the flesh. But we are always looking on the outside. God looks at the inside and judges a person, not the outside. That's why it said, it's not what goes into a man that defiles him, but what comes out of him, what's coming out of you comes back to words bring life and death. They either build up or destroy. And I've said it I've said a number of times. No one's ever overdosed on encouragement. No one. No one's ever, you've never just seen someone they're so encouraged that they have over I don't know how you would overdose on encouragement. 
You're too kind to others. You've just been too encouraged and you've become too nice to others. So, you're done. So, well, we ran out of online questions. William. Yeah. So we're refining Jesus anew every day. Yes. So the question being the distinction between the office of a prophet versus the the gift of the prophetic. Well, we're introduced into the gift of the prophetic in First Corinthians. I you know uh, where I earnestly desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. And so there's a, there's a there's a pushing. For everybody to desire the uh, spiritual gifts. Um, actually, I taught on this a while back. Yes, there it is. Found my notes. It's called the science of the prophetic. Um, and so, let's let's look at First Corinthians uh, twelve, starting in verse one. That's a great question, William. William of the Shreve. So 1 Corinthians 12, starting in verse 1. What I want to talk to you now is is the various ways God's Spirit gets worked into our lives. This is a complex and often misunderstood, but I want you to be informed and knowledgeable. Remember how you were when you didn't know God, led from one phony God to another, never knowing what you were doing, just doing it because everybody else did it. It's different in this life. God wants to use your, our intelligence to seek and understand as well as we can. For instance, by using your heads, you, you know perfectly well that the Spirit of God would never prompt anyone to say, Jesus, something, something false. Nor would anyone say, would, nor would anyone be inclined to say, Jesus is master without insight of the Holy Spirit. So here we were introduced. Now, it really gets said is in 12.1, now concerning spiritual gifts. And this would be considered spiritual things. Um, 1 Corinthians 12, starting in verse 4, God's various gifts are handed out everywhere, but they are all originate in God's spirit. God's various ministries are carried out everywhere, but they are all originate in uh, God's various expressions of power are in action everywhere, but God himself is behind it all. Each person is given something to do that shows who God is. Everyone gets in on it. Everyone benefits. All kinds of things are handed out by the Spirit and to all kinds of people. The variety is wonderful. And so he goes in and starts explaining the various spiritual gifts that are available. However, like we're emphasizing on the gift of prophecy, so there's what's considered the manifestation gift of prophecy. It's the thing that kind of comes through because... what is? We all know the, the scripture from Joel. My spirit will be poured out upon all flesh, and then it gets later repeated in the book of Acts. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams, so on and so forth. <clears throat> and so here we have, you know, we've, we've figured out that because of what has happened through the upper room and the Holy Spirit falling upon the 12 disciples and utterances and tongues of fire, things of that nature, everyone was baptized in the Spirit. And the gifts of God are irrevocable. They're without repentance. So anyone and everyone's walking in these types in these types of various types, they don't realize it. Sometimes it just hasn't been embraced. Uh, sometimes it gets labeled something different. Sometimes they have insight into things they don't know how to explain. So you have the gift of prophecy, 
and the manifestation aspect of it is because, well, you're a child of God. You're going to walk in that. And then from there, it's what's considered the grace, grace gift or the charisma gift. And that is where it's, where you have, you know, prophesy, edify, or edification, exhort, build up, encourage, that sort of thing. And that's your manifestation gift. And then you have your charisma gift, the grace gift of prophecy, which is going to, it's, it's a little bit different. That becomes like a training ground, so to speak, or it could become the developmental ground of character building and all that kind of goes into the office of a prophet. And where the, the, it's not necessarily the revelation, but the authority is different. And so you'll find, you may, you know, in the charisma gift or the, the gift of the prophetic, you may find, you know, where you have like a gift that's not, not necessarily just in the manifestation sense, but it's, there's something of a, like an impartation. It's part of your spiritual gift mixing. And in that, There'll be a different authority on what you what you on what you speak and what you say. You have um, there's a little bit more of a it's more like a, you have a bit on your tongue on your mouth and what you can and what you can't say. And in that, at, it's through intimacy will kind of, it's really intimacy, not necessarily gifting all this. I've met very gifted people, some of the most gifted individuals, and people loved it. And they're like, this is the greatest thing ever. This person's the most prophetic person ever. But they were gifted. But the spirit in which they operated in necessarily wasn't the spirit of God. They were encouraging to an extent, but anytime I, you know, I, like I'd have a friend that would, that would cross paths and I'd be like, so what you, what do you, what did you think? And they're like, man, this person told me things that I've only told God. I said, oh, and they were like, I've never met anyone so prophetic. I said, that's not prophetic. All they did was tell you what was already inside of you. That's not revealing Jesus. That's revealing your soul. That's a second heaven. That's a, that's a different gift. That's not the prophetic. The prophetic would reveal the Lord, not what's going on inside your soul. Now, are there times where God will identify what's going on in your life? Yes, but at the, the purpose of that is to reveal where the Lord is in that process. Knowing, hey, yes, you are going through this, and this these things are happening, but here's where Jesus is. See, the prophetic isn't about information. It's, it's the revealing of Jesus. It's pulling back the curtain and showing the Wizard of Oz. We already... You, a, a person with skinned knees doesn't go, need someone to go, hey, I, I perceive that your knees are skinned. Like, we already know that. Like, you must be prophetic. It's like walking outside. You remember the Smart Rock? You guys you remember, remember that? It was, it was called a Smart Rock. If this rock is cold, it's cold outside. If this rock is wet, it's oh, raining. Yeah. Like, if this rock is hot, it's, it's warm outside. That is what the prophetic, to a degree, has become. We've watched the news and said, bad things are happening. A duh. You see inflation go up. We're going to see inflation go. Like, that's not prophetic. I can watch the news. I mean, in my, where I work, it, it's, it's an everyday conversation. We talk so much about inflation, you'd think that we sold helium. But So the question is, are those people psychics? Not necessarily. They be full on believers, but they're pushing. 
to get information. They're eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But we always think because knowledge is good, it's not bad. But however, the knowledge that's good is the worst of the bad because it makes it look like it's God, but it's not God. It's like it, it's like it, be thing up here and God's above it, but you can see through it. So you feel like you can see God. I feel like I'm doing the YMCA. But in all actuality, what you're seeing, you, you're, this is the good and you see God but you're still not seeing God. And we fall for that all the time. Well, it looks like God. It is or it isn't. It's that simple. It either, it either reveals Jesus or it doesn't. Because it's one thing to have the date of a thing. It's another thing to know what Jesus is going to do in the midst of that. And this is like, I've been, see, oftentimes when a, when a statement or statements like that come from somebody, it's usually from a, a place of, lack of experience in a sense. But I've been the guy that's like, there's going to be an abnormal moon coming and, and it's going to last for the next three days and me have no knowledge of it. Actually, I probably somewhere on my website. But there was, I was like, there's three days of encounter coming and it's going to be marked by an abnormal moon and it's going to happen uh, in the next 24 hours. And I put out the word, and then I, and then someone sends me an article from like spacenews.net or something. I don't know what it was. And they're like, did you know this was happening? I said, no, I didn't. Just, you know, but people get more stuck on, why is the moon doing that? Who cares? The Lord is speaking. We get caught up on like, well, my, my, my microwave says finished. What's it mean? Well, it means that your TV dinner's done. You know, or I keep on hearing, I keep on seeing 444 everywhere I go. What's that mean? Or 911 or 311 or what 411 or whatever. I see 222 everywhere I go. What do you, are you only checking the clock at 222? Um, but we often get like, we get, oh, the, is, you know, an open door and no man can shut it and it's, it's God's opened it and no man can close it and all this stuff and the keys of David are resting on my shoulder. I feel like God's speaking more than just that. Now we've, see we've created these formulas and we, we ourselves, we're so concerned about people being manipulative but we're over here in prophetical witchcraft. But I get all this revelation Is it revealing Jesus? Is it showing what the Lord's doing? I mean, and here's the thing is God will allow us to go down that path. That's the scary part. God will allow us to go down that part, path and we get into these super mystical mindsets. Uh, I've done it. And it's actually just much simpler. I used to, I used to actually, I was in a, in a place for a while where I was kind of like spiritually depressed because I wasn't having all these experiences anymore. I didn't have anything to write about on Facebook. That's really what it was. I didn't have anything to write a book about anymore. And, uh, but, but the Lord was speaking, speaking. And then it like started really making sense. Like, if there's a prophet amongst you, this is what it says in Numbers. If there's a prophet amongst you, I'll speak to him in a riddle, a dream, a dark saying. Something that has to be figured out. I don't need more of that in my life. I need less of that. But not to Moses. I speak face to face as a friend speaks to a friend. 
That's the real desire. That should be the real hunger that we have. Not another dream, not another vision, not another encounter. And I get the desire and the hunger for those things because they're fun, they're cool, they're experiential knowledge. I love experiential knowledge. I love that. It was through, the, it was through dreams that I really learned how to hear the Lord. And I really began to trust him because I would have all these dreams, but I didn't know what they mean, but I didn't like the per I didn't like the meanings that people were giving me to the dreams. And I was like, something like, why does every dream I tell you have a negative bend on it? The common denominator is not the dream, it's you. And so I would start having these dreams, but I wanted to know what they meant. And so I'd like, Lord, help me. And so like, there's this like twilight hour, so to speak, not like twilight, like, you know, like, you know, Forks, Washington, but like twilight era time period and kind of between like six and eight a.m. And in that twilight time, we have we're like it's easy to kind of slip it in and out of these dreams, out of this dream state. And I'm not talking new agey. I'm just saying like. Have you ever just wake up, have a dream, like, and you wake up and you're like, oh, I had a dream, and then you fall back asleep, and, well, that would happen as I would wake up from the dream about 6.30, but, like, you know, I'm saved, so I don't wake up at 6.30. Um, I rest in the Lord. That's what I name my bed, the Lord. Um, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, old Bible school joke, uh, but I didn't go to Bible school. And so I would fall back asleep. Now I would have a dream that I was telling that person that I didn't like their interpretations. My, I was telling them my dream. And in the dream that I was having telling them about the dream I had 27 seconds before. I would, they would tell me the interpretation of the dream. In my dream. So I would have a dream telling someone about my dream. And in that I would hear the meaning of my dream. But then it became, but what that did is that built a relationship and a trust over time. So I'm not throwing those things out where it can easily get, <coughs> where it can easily get misconstrued that I'm saying dreams and visions are bad. No, dreams and visions make up like two thirds of the Bible. So they're not bad. I'm not saying they're not of any value or worth, what I'm saying is, but there's a, there's a next, I don't even want to call it level. Like in, in marriage, you don't look at intimacy as levels. It's not like a video game. It's, it's, it's various forms of depths of intimacy. And when you get to this place of intimacy, you're no longer having to try to figure out what they're saying and interpret the signs. You know, it's now you just, you just know. It's, and you get into this place, just like when G, just like when God spoke at the baptism of Jesus, this is my son who I love, listen to him. That's the same thing that would culturally happen when a father would uh, have a business and then his son would take over. You're no longer having to listen to step-by-step -step instructions as you would like if you're making a cake or something like that. How many times do you guys, I know you bake a lot. So like, do you ever look at the instructions anymore? You've probably made them your own at this point. Exactly. Why? Because you know how to do it. William. I try not to. I th that's kind of a multi-part question. We are always discounting what's inside of us. Always. The reality is this, is he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So there's absolutely nothing to truly be afraid of. It's the, it's, it's the same reason where you can walk into a place and it's like, well, that place is demonic. I can't walk in there. 
I don't know about you, but I got this little light of mine. I'm going to let that thing shine. Now, do I carry wisdom in what I do sometimes? Yes. You're good. So, to answer your question, yes, we are discounting what's inside of us already. But at the same time, we, we don't want to discount and discredit dreams or visions or encounters or experiences. But at the same time, if we're actively pursuing those and not the Lord, we will be handed over to those and not the Lord. Very much so. Um, you know, and then you're seeking that rather than seeking God because you're seeking that feeling or that emotion that came with that experience. Yeah, so we, it's like a, dr we, become a we become like adrenaline junkies chasing after the encounter. Because, it, I mean, think about it. If, because studies have figured out of how text messages and notifications like through social media and we want to blame like this day and age and the internet and things like that it we're not those shouldn't be blamed it's the human brain we've created a uh, uh, we have a craving for dopamine hits and it hits harder than like any other drug and we're and so in those moments we what we're craving in those moments isn't hearing the lord per se it's we're craving this. We like the highs. We want to stay up here. Because even normal scares us. We don't like being normal. We don't want to be steady. We don't want to, we don't want to be on a normal playing field. We want a high all the time. And whether that high comes through... I mean, there's times where people... We know people that have... Their high was spiritual warfare. Everything was coming against them. And so they built this platform off of that. But that's not the Lord. But then you... But then we build a platform off of all these other encounters, all these other experiences. Also, not the Lord. We've, we've, we're chasing adrenaline, not the Spirit of God. And so when we're chasing adrenaline... We're missing out on just walking with the Lord. Yes. Earlier you were talking about the office. And like recently I shared a dream with you that could have, you know, could have had application to a larger audience that you helped me to see. Right. Well, I mean, it's one, to give you a surety, first and foremost. I used to have this message when I, when I ran a ministry school called uh, Drink, Drink the Kool-Aid. And it was based upon the fact of, like, if your life isn't being changed by your message, then why would anyone else's? If we're not... And the example was... If you saw three different Kool-Aid stands, I don't, or lemonade stands, or whatever it is, and one kid's not paying attention, the other kid's just, he's the ultimate salesperson, and then one kid's over there drinking his own Kool-Aid, which one are you going to buy? I'm probably going to go with the kid that's drinking his own Kool-Aid. Yeah. 
So, if somebody's life is being impacted or changed by what's going, like, what, what the Lord is doing on the inside of them, that gives you actually more authority than the person who just shares a revelation without the, walking out the experience of it. What you're talking about is influence, not authority. Influence is the ability, the, how far you can get the message to go out. Authority is the weight of impact. You can throw a bunch of sand into a lake, but it's not going to splash. You can throw one big rock into a lake and it'll make a much bigger splash. That's the difference between authority and influence. Influence looks like a bunch of grains of sand being thrown out into a body of water. And they just go bloop, bloop, bloop. And then the rock, which is bigger and heavier, get, is thrown out and goes Poof. And then, because the, how, many, how many grains of sand would it take to actually creep, create a ripple effect? It only takes one big rock. That's the difference. We're often confusing influence with authority. Just because somebody has a large platform doesn't mean that they carry the authority. It just means they're popular. Well, exactly, which would be authority. We've hyped up the word anointed. We think anointed is, we confuse it with charisma. Anointed is like God's seal of approval. God, it's they carry weight, which is authority. And so, oftentimes we see people that have they have a lot of grains of sand, and they can throw it really far out. But they themselves, but it doesn't necessarily make a big splash. It doesn't carry weight. And so we see that all the time. We all know people who, you know, carry a big, a big splash, but it doesn't always go very far. But it goes further in the people that they make the big splash in. It's not so much how many people hear it, it's how many people are changed by it. How many people are you truly impacting? That's, that's real authority. So, does that answer the question? So the, the question was, is how, do, how do we get there? How do we get to that place of intimacy? <laughs> time. It's just time. It's... it's how do you build intimacy in a relationship? But it, it's time and experience. It's commitment. We're looking for a... There is no formula to a successful marriage. As long as we... As much as we keep looking, at a, looking for a step ladder like it's hopscotch, we're living according to a formula trying to walk with God. It's trust, it's dependency, it's the realization that sometimes it may not work out the way that we think it is. And it's, and it's the idea that... But the, here's the thing is, after, when we start building trust in that and leaning into that, it's the same way that you... It's the same way that I've moved across the country three or four times. Or out of the country. I just had to d lean and depend on him. And that's what, it, that's what creates it. You, you just have this, this experiential knowledge, but it's not experience. See, the thing is, is we're building our experiential knowledge off of delusions of grandeur imaginative experiences that aren't in our mind. And it's e there's even studies that have been released that show that Christians have this thing about when they talk about stuff is as if they've done it. But they yet have not actually done a thing. They haven't experienced it. 
and we live in this dis, we live we live in this delusional place and we and we we try to blanket it with terms like faith or I'm walking in faith. I mean, as running a ministry school, how many people told me that they were going to, that they were just living by faith, but yet racking up their credit card bill? They were living by faith, but they were begging everybody for money. We literally, we would have people show up and go, I'm just traveling by faith, and God told me to come here because you would give me a hotel. No, that's manipulation. And I've been around that block a few times. I've been around the block where I've been the one doing it. You know, I've been... Sow a seed, receive a prophetic word. I've done it. I've been there. I'm not proud of it. But at least I can admit, hey, you know what? I was wrong. But out of a, but a genuine heart came forth. I was a little misguided. There's, there was a many times where Brad was kicking my butt. <laughs> but I came out of it. Because it wasn't right. Does that mean I sit there and ridicule everybody else that's doing it? No. Nah. I mean, I try not to get critical. Because there's no room for that. Me getting critical is me is is me being childish, not being free. Me being free is loving them. Me being really me getting really set free is sometimes giving <laughs> and just walking away. So how do we walk in it? How do we get there? It's just walking with him. It's trusting. It's the same way you guys have your relationship. You just have to trust him. And he has to love you. That's, all, that's what it is. I mean, the more we can get into the realization that walking with the Lord is nothing more than just like a marriage in a sense, I think the better off we'll be. Because it's, it's allowing us... To, you, we as the bride of Christ have to let down all our walls and allow ourselves to be known and allow ourselves to be loved. And I think allowing ourselves to be loved is actually probably harder than loving because it's easy to give out of, to give out of ourselves. But to allow ourselves to be loved, to be like, being able to be willing to say, you know what, I'm just in a place right now where I just... I need to be loved. That's hard. We think strength is walking resiliently without saying a word when in all actuality, strength is being able to go, hey, you know what? I can't do this on my own. That's real strength. Real strength is being able to say, you know what? I need help. I need family. I need friends. Real strength is, you know what? Depression is kicking my butt right now. And I can't do this on my own. Strength is reaching out to somebody late at night when you don't know if they're even going to answer or see it because anxiety is rearing up. That's strength. That's not weakness. We get told right in our face, that voice that sits right here and tells us, you're weak. That's not weakness. That's strength. One could put a, if one could put a thousand to flight, two could put ten thousand. Think about that. If you are going through a battle by yourself, you can defeat a thousand of those lies, but two of you can defeat ten thousand. But yet we want to be strong. I think we just need to start calling it for what it is. Lies. So, 
walking it out, learning to lean in, becoming like John. There's no formula. It's not hopscotch. It's just step by step. And it's how many hard conversations have you had in, in, in your relationship but made it better in the end? Having those hard conversations produces intimacy. So that's my answer on how do you how do you get there? Where there is, I don't know. <laughs> Does that answer the question about the authority and the prophetical? That's what I tried to do. Any other questions? Negative. Well, I think we've successfully talked everybody away. We've made them all leave. We have successfully done this. Well, Jesus help us. Help us in the long run, because we need it. Draw close to us as we draw near to you. Sure would be great if you'd illuminate the path. Maybe put, put some bumper lanes up to help us walk, not fall in a ditch. But we love you, Lord. We thank you.